To put it into perspective how little 1 megabyte actually is, in total all the footage combined for this video comes out to 690 megabytes. A question may arise, how is this exactly possible? My answer, websites. Websites have the innate ability to display graphics and read our input, while taking up extremely low amounts of storage. But I want to make a game that runs on our desktop and not in a browser. I'll get an answer for that as well. We make our own browser, but we strip from it all the features that make it a browser and in its URL write our game files. But first, let's take a few steps back and actually make all this. Step 1. Open Visual Studio. Step 2. Create new Windows Forms application. Step 3. Install Microsoft Web View 2 plugin. Step 4. Drag Web View onto your forum and stretch it out until it covers the forum. Step 5. Name it something epic and set the program's icon to something epic as well. Step 6. Write code which resizes the Web View to always fit the screen. Step 7. Input the location of your game files into the Web View source. Step 8. Export the project and admire your ghetto web browser. Now, let's code something simple to test our new browser. Something like a simple square which moves around when you press the arrow keys should do the job. Alright, looking good. Now that we have the reassurance that our browser is working, let's detail the code and start the real project. So, here's my pitch for the under 1 megabyte game. A sandbox game where everything is just text. So all this one long text, that's made up of letters which convey different things. G being grass, W water, T trees, and so on. The very first thing I wrote was a script for the world generation. Where we generate the world is through defining two values. First, what size we want the world to be. This will dictate how many tiles the world will consist of. The second is how wide we want the world to be. Whenever we set the second value at, is how many tiles will be on each row of the world. Next, I added some logic, which replaces some of the grass with water. But the way this algorithm works is by assigning every tile at the start of the game, randomly either 0 or 1. If a tile gets assigned 0, it will stay as grass. If not, in its place water will spawn. After that, I moved on to working on the player script. The very first thing we do in the player script is, after the world gets loaded, find one random tile and swap it out with a white key. Before we continue the development, let's quickly check the storage. And it looks like we are at 1.27 kilobytes so far. Next, let's give the player the ability to move left and right. We can achieve this by first finding the tiles which are to the left and right of the player, and by second replacing them with our player tile. Now our player can work around horizontally. But there's one big issue. We do replace the tiles with the player, but we aren't changing the previous tiles the player was on back to its initial value. Here's how we fix this issue. In the world generation script, we declare a new empty variable called tiles. And every time we generate a new tile, we add it to that variable. Now we go over to the player script and each time we press a key, so every time the player moves, we use the tiles variable to reassign all the tiles their original values, apart from the one which a player is standing on. Just like that, we are able to give the player the function for walking, but we've only covered walking horizontally, so let's write code for moving vertically as well. Same as it is for the horizontal movement, first thing we need to do is find the tiles which are next to the player, but to find the tiles which are above and below the player we need a slightly more complex calculation. To find the upper tile we need to minus the player's index width of the rows that make up the world plus the remainder between the player's indexes and the world rows division. And finally we minus all of this once again, the remainder of the player's indexes and the world rows division. To find the lower tile, we flip the calculation, so we add all of this to the player's index except of subtracting it. Hope I didn't lose you there after this mini maths lesson, cause now we are able to move in all four directions. You probably notice how when the player moves up and down, the tiles don't always line up. This is because every single letter takes up different amounts of space. The way we can fix this and make every letter line up properly is by using what are known as monospace fonts. Monospace fonts are type of fonts where characters take up an equal amount of space, negating any horizontal misplacements. The font I'm using is one I made myself. It's in fact not a monospace font. So the first idea that came to mind was to simply convert my regular font into a monospace one. But after the conversion, things were not looking too good. The letters M, B, W, and X were wider than all the other characters. Once this revelation came to me, I tried to shrink the set characters, but they simply didn't come out looking all too well. So I did the next best thing. I drew an entirely different font and carefully made every letter the same width. And by the end, it came out quite well. At this point in the development, the storage was at 2.71 kilobytes. 
After solving one problem, another one popped up. For some indiscernible reason, whenever the player moves out from the very last tile, the tile still stays as a player. I honestly didn't have any clues on what was causing this bug. The only clue I had was that it had something to do with the tile being the final one, so I came up with rather a juvenile solution. I told the world generation script to make this world with one extra tile and then simply remove it. Silly idea for sure, but it did end up working, so I ain't complaining. After fixing that, I decided to improve the way I generate the tiles. I decided that at first all the tiles would be grass, and then we will generate the rest of the tile types. To generate new tiles, I wrote a new function, which takes in four values, first what character the tile is, second what color it is, third how many of which will be generated, and fourth what tiles they can replace. The great thing about this function is how many possibilities it grants us. We can easily create different types of tiles like trees, rocks, water, and also it's in our control how many of these tiles should be generated as well. And one more great thing about this function is that it totally works with any size of world we want to generate. We can have a medium size world or a tiny one or rather a large one. But keep in mind that larger the world is, longer it takes to generate. And also that there's a chance your game might just crash. Next, I made another function which generates water in the formation that resembles a river. Alright, now let's stay away from the generation for a little bit and actually make the world interactive. Let's make it so the water pushes you away. The way we do this is by first finding out if the tiles we are on is water, if it is, we run a function which chooses a random direction to move you in. We can also readjust the speed at which you get pushed with very easily. The way I went about writing the water reaction code was through repeating a lot of code, which bloated the player script significantly, taking it from 1 to 2 kilobytes to 4.66 kilobytes, which in turn took the whole game up to 6.73 kilobytes. Afterwards, I made each of the grass tiles assign to themselves a random shade of green, which definitely made things look much better. Now let's add some collision. Let's stop the player's movement when there's a tree in the way. This was relatively simple to program. I just had to add a condition to our movement code which checks if the tile next to the player is tree or not. If it is, we don't pass the code through to the movement. Before moving on, I'd like to propose a question. What's one feature unanimous to every survival sandbox system? That's right, an inventory system. So let's make one. First, let's declare a new script. Next, let's write some Mr. Robot Hackerman stuff. And wow, just like that we have an inventory system. Now, this may look confusing to you, but let me explain. The white zeros signify empty slots. The red A is an X. The line under the slot shows which slot is currently active. We can cycle through the slots with the number keys. After implementing the inventory system, I brainstormed on how the control should work with the X. I decided on the simplest idea. Basically, as long as you have an X in your active slot and you move in the direction of a tree, you chop that tree down, which is very satisfying if I may add. And after you chop a tree down in your first free slot, you acquire wood, which you can place down once again by using the movement keys. But there are three problems with the wood we need to fix. First is collision. Second, not being able to cut it with your X to recollect it. And the third problem is that we need to add to our inventory system another system which keeps track of items. So we don't just have infinite amounts of items every time we pick up one. First two problems are easy enough. We just have to repurpose the same lines that handle the collision and tree cutting down logic. But the third problem though requires a bit more finesse to resolve. First, we need to enter the inventory script and create a new variable. This variable will hold the same amount of values as how many slots the inventory consists of. Next, we head to the player script, and every time we run the code which chops down a tree, we need to increase the number that's inside the variable we just made. Then decrease the number inside the code that handles the wood placement. Also, we need to write logic which removes the wood from our inventory when the item count in our variable is at zero. And that's it. Now we have a working inventory system and a working wood placement system as well, which we can use to build a kill to a house, or to cut through rivers, or to just zoom across the entire world. Next, I wanted to add a different type of body of water, so I wrote this absolutely monstrous lines of code, which trust me, you don't want me to explain. All you need to know is that now we can generate random amounts of this to buy two clumps of water around the world, which adds some more diversity to the world chain. And this is basically where I hold the development at, to make this video. So, let's check the final storage amount for the game, and it looks like the game is at 15.1 kilobytes. 
You guys might have seen that I described the game as complex in the title, but the game in reality is quite simple. This is actually where you guys come. I want everyone watching this video to imagine the game as an empty canvas, which you guys can paint on with your suggestions, written in the description. So put those big brains of yours to work and throw some ideas at me. Ideas which I will implement into the game and showcase in the next installment of the series. So yeah, that's all for today everyone. I can't wait to see all your suggestions. Until next time. Bye guys.